Hello, everybody. Uh, on behalf of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Women in Human Computer Interaction Lecture Series, uh, we are very excited to welcome uh, Dr. Rosalind Picard here from MIT. She got her PhD in uh, Electrical and Computer Science in, at MIT and continues at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, has done amazing work bringing a digital and scientific framework to thinking about emotion and emotion of computers, emotion of us with the computers. So without further delay, I will welcome Roz Picard. Thanks. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I, before I start, I'd actually like to get to know you for just a second, and that is um, this is a very broad uh, topic that I'm going to be addressing, especially since I threw in the autism word here. And I'm curious how many of you came today because you have a friend or family member or somebody you're close to who uh, has autism? Um, okay, good sprinkling there, yes. And how many come from more of a technical engineering, computer science type background? All right, and how many from maybe the arts or humanities or social sciences? And Oh, great mix. Awesome. All right. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I love seeing the interdisciplinary flavor. I've um, been getting a nice taste of it here. I think it, most of the uh, real exciting stuff is happening at the boundaries between these. So hopefully we'll have a good time touching on several of those during this, this talk. I'd like to, uh, next thing I'd like to do is ask you to pretend with me, uh, and this is a little dangerous to do after lunch, uh, <laughs> that you are not here but that you are wherever you go to work when you have an intense deadline. Maybe some of you have that right now and you're procrastinating it, so forget about that if so. Um, but imagine you're wherever you go, you know, if you go somewhere to hide or somewhere to be around people, wherever that is, office, parked car in a desolate place, wherever you have to go to escape, when you have to crank and focus on something. And let's assume you have a really important deadline in a couple hours, you're working hard on that, you're in that place, and you can close your eyes if you dare, uh, and imagine this. And while you're in that place, uh, focused on this important deadline, the following things happen to you. Someone comes in, uh, doesn't introduce himself, uh, doesn't seem to notice how busy you are, doesn't apologize for interrupting you, uh, and you respond looking a teeny bit annoyed. Uh, I don't know your own way that you express annoyance, but let's just say this individual doesn't seem to notice that you're annoyed. Uh, the individual offers you some advice, some completely useless advice, and so you express a little bit more annoyance. Now, you may be the type who shows this um, subtly on your face. Uh, maybe you're not so subtle. Some cultures, people make gestures and speak their uh, negativity very freely. Uh, and in any case, he just ignores whatever it was you did to communicate that. And this goes on. Um, he continues to offer useless advice. Until however subtle you were at the beginning, all right, now you're not subtle anymore. Okay, you're very clear, this is unwelcome and uh, unpleasant for you. He ignores it. Um, you've had enough of this, and so it's, you've got to get back to this important deadline. And so what you do is you just clearly say, look, leave, all right? Uh, maybe you even escort him to the door. Well, fortunately, he does leave, but before he leaves, um, he winks and does a happy little dance. Uh, um, now, I don't know about you, but, but this is not what I would consider uh, emotionally intelligent behavior. This is not the kind of behavior that I would be excited to have come back into my office or place where I go to, to work. And, uh, and yet, this is the behavior that we have seen in one of the most intelligent and widely distributed software systems that's uh, been put out into the public <laughs> space. Um, Gather there are some PC users out there still, uh, the Microsoft Office Assistant. Now, this is not to harp on Microsoft. Uh, they're a sponsor of our lab and good friends. And they, they know, in fact, what's in the software, right, really is a lot of extremely intelligent machine learning and recognition of what's going on. Um, however, they were focused on something very different when they built this. And they were not focused on what we're going to focus on today, which I think may be even more important than a lot of the things they focus on. You know, it's real smart about knowing things like if you're writing a letter or what you're doing, the actions, the sort of the when, what, where kind of stuff. But it's not very smart about the how you're doing, the feelings. And these are vital in human interaction. Uh, we learn quickly that those who can see that their boss or their advisor is pleased or displeased are the ones who are more likely to succeed than the ones who walk around kind of oblivious to that. 
uh, repeatedly making mistakes like, like this thing has made. So what are some of these mistakes? Well, not noticing that you're annoyed, right? Not recognizing your emotion. Uh, what about um, when the emotion escalates, right? Sometimes emotions um, maybe should, should be ignored, okay? But when they escalate, they should not be ignored. They should probably be responded to in some way. An apology, an acknowledgement, shriveling up and looking, uh, you know, showing deference, uh, whatever. Something that is appropriately respectful. Um, and this happy little dance winky stuff, you know, maybe that was really cute and fun when you're um, in there test driving some new software product, you know, and you're in some new lab and it's novel and it's exciting and these kinds of behaviors kind of go with the mood. But, you know, when you're under the gun with a really important deadline and something's irritating you and now it looks happy at your misfortune, right, that's, that's completely um, unintelligent about when and where it's expressing that emotion. So we are um, thinking a lot about these skills of emotional intelligence and uh, the field of affective computing has has been growing up in a way to try to help people to understand and develop these with technology to improve these interactions with, with people, as well as in some branches to also make the technology itself uh, be more intelligent. Uh, so here's a quick summary of them. I'll use this very roughly as a template today. Uh, mostly, I'm, I'm gonna talk uh, about um, some of our work with facial expressions, recognizing emotion, a little bit of the importance of uh, this before you try to express emotion. And then I'm going to weave in a bunch of stuff we're doing with autism down here. I'll try to um, show you how that's actually, uh, how that collides very nicely with this work. So very quickly, first of all, expressing emotion is, uh, it's, it's really easy, right? Like Max, you know, for years displayed a smile when they boot up. Um, one could say that looks like it's expressing emotion. It looks like it's happy to see you. Uh, pretty smart, right? Um, but I think a much more important question is not how do you get the, avatar or the robot or the computer to express emotion, you know, move its face or change its voice or whatever, but um, how do you know which one to express when? And this is a challenging problem and it's an extremely important problem. I'm going to cite some work here from uh, Cliff Nass and colleagues out at Stanford uh, with a, one of many experiments they've done in this space. Here they wanted to know what emotion to express when and, well actually they didn't want that, they wanted to know if the car voice in uh, the GPS system they were designing should sound, uh, yeah, how should it sound, right? How should a car voice sound? You know, male, female, British, American, you know, all these questions. Uh, the question they looked at was, should it sound cheery, you know, kind of happy, um, or should it sound more subdued? And they smartly looked at uh, this in conjunction with the state of the driver. So here is the driver uh, first shown kind of some happy movies, make you laugh a little bit. So the driver in these two columns is in a happy state, mildly happy, right? Uh, it's not like you just granted them their PhD or something. You know? This is just a subtle movie manipulation. Uh, but by the way, that's the best day to get happy data on MIT campus on graduation day. You just walk around and everybody's giddy. It's really infectious. Um, the other case was showing people war footage, movies, you know, where it's kind of disturbing. So the drivers were mildly upset. These were all in simulators, by the way. And then the um, car voice was crossed with that. And they looked at a lot of things, two of which I've grabbed here, and all of the measures were in the same direction as these. Uh, number of accidents, which of course you would like to be small. And minutes the driver was able to speak. So the driver is, the voice is asking the driver questions, the driver is answering them. And if the driver is very cognitively loaded uh, or you know, a lot of demands on the driver, cognitively or affectively loaded, one would expect the driver would not be able to speak as much, right? Describe the building you just drove by, uh, white, right? You know, if you're loaded, versus if everything's under control, you would say, oh, it was white and kind of rounded and had these interesting three layers of windows, you know, sort of the more you could talk, the less loaded you were. So we want that to be high. Um, so what do we find? We find that the best case is where the driver is happy and the voice is matching it, is enthused also. The lowest number of accidents and the greatest ability to um, speak. Uh, the next best case, however, is when the driver is upset and the voice is subdued. Uh, and there, um, 6.3 accidents, quite a bit more, okay? Um, upset drivers are much less safe drivers. If your friend is upset about something, please um, drive them. Don't let them drive. Uh, this is a, a lot more accidents when people are upset. But interestingly, um, one of the worst case is not so much when the driver's just upset, because you can deal with the subdued voice and lower the accidents and raise the minutes of speaking. 
The worst case is when the driver's upset and the voice is all cheery, right? This is like that happy paperclip, okay? You're upset, go away, leave me alone, it keeps persisting, right? And then when it smiles and you know, dances in front of you, then you're really mad, right? And you wanna shoot the thing. And in fact, online, you, know, you can see people with their little clippies hanging from nooses and guns and stuff like that. And I wonder, I don't know the story, but I, people send me these news clips from time to time, you know, where like the chef in New York got so mad at his computer, he threw it in the deep fat fryer. Right? And I just wonder, like, what, what was it doing right before that moment? Right? Was it doing something that was happy at his misfortune? So these are the things that lead to really bad results. High number of accidents, minutes driver spoke. So the point here is not that computers should, should be expressive so much as they should, if they're going to be expressive, they need to pay attention to what your state is. Because if they express something uh, that, like, is happy when you're upset, that's a recipe for danger here, right? Uh, to you or people in the car um, or possibly to the computer or robot or agent or others around you. So intelligently expressing uh, emotion is gonna require, first of all, recognizing what the person is expressing, right? So if you look like this, you know, this happy stuff needs to stop, right? Oh, by the way, this um, is not a new great insight uh, in the HCI community. It goes back at least thousands of years to Proverbs here, uh, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on soda is one who sings songs to a heavy heart, right? The pain of that cheery stuff being piped into you when you're, um, when you're not actually cheery at all. That's all I'm going to say about expressing, because I think the harder problem is um, recognizing the state of the person interacting with the technology, and then being smart about how you express in response to that. And here we've done tons of work over the years, as have many other groups now, recognizing facial information, vocal information, physiology, and uh, you know, reasoning about situations with AI, as well as doing a lot of signal processing and pattern recognition of multiple modalities. I won't go into all of this here. There's, there's lots of work online. I can point you to all this later. But we're, we're going to look a little bit at, at two of the signals uh, in this talk. I'll try to do live demonstrations of those. There's, uh, people ask, you know, what do you measure to measure emotion? And anything on this list and pretty much anything you can measure is fair game because emotion modulates just about everything you do. You know, if all you have is a sensor on a water bottle, the, you know, the person who kind of picks it up with this little droopy movement is probably not as cheery as the person who swoops it up, you know, with these adverbs that are, you know, upward and, and um, joyful, right? The adverbs of the movement can be more important than, than you know, the fact that I'm smiling or not. Right? We have people having true smiles of happiness even when they've just flubbed up something. So you have to be very careful uh, to look at, at you know, multiple measures and the context and everything if you're going to make an inference about somebody's affective state from any one of these, these signals. Any one of them alone is not going to give you a magic read of people's feelings. Uh, by the way, the, um, what used to be considered since able to be sensed at a distance, the stuff that usually we can you know, see or hear at a distance, face, voice, posture, gestures, and so forth. Uh, this, this is now creeping down a uh, growing amount of our physiological parameters that used to require electrodes and skin surface contact can now be sensed at a, dif at a distance as well. I don't know about you, I find some of that troubling, disconcerting, especially given that most of the work in that area is going on with uh, governments who um, wish to know how you're feeling without you even knowing that they um, are measuring that. And if you're interested in that, we could talk more about that offline, too. Now, a lot of people think that the face is this great messenger of your feelings. And it is a great messenger of your feelings. Uh, but it's not so simple as just mapping some facial movements to basic emotion states. And I'll, I'll, here I'll point you to this work by Avizer and others in, in Israel, uh, an example I like from their work. How many of you have heard of the basic emotions, the so-called Ekman Basic Six? A few hands here. So these are listed here, joy, anger, sadness, disgust, fear, surprise. And I'm going to ask you, which of these six, here's a quiz for you, uh, is the man showing on his face in the next image, OK? Read the face. Is it joy, anger, sadness, disgust, fear, or surprise? Joy, anger, sadness, disgust, fear, or surprise? Who, who wants to venture a guess? Anger. Anger. Yep. How many people think anger? This is easy, right? 
Okay, how many people think something else? A few others. Okay, surprise? Joy. Okay. Yeah, there's a little so, joy in there. Yeah. So back to the list. Joy, anger, sadness, disgust, fear, surprise. It sounds like the majority think this is anger. Right? Now, here's one more um, quiz for you. Same six emotions. Now what do you see on his face? <laughs> disgust. Right? How many people see disgust? Okay. Yep. And how many people see something else? It's the same face. Yeah. Okay. Now here's the trick. Right? The face is identical in these two. Um, but most people in this um, study done in Israel, and I've, um, we can see this happening here in Iowa too, uh, see more disgust in this one and more anger in this one. The exact, and now this is the Ekman face of disgust, basically. When the face is in this configuration, it's supposed to be disgust. In fact, had I shown you this one first, probably there would have been fewer people trusting this one as anger, because it really is more of a disgust face. But in fact, because they're similar, because the disgust and anger faces are similar, and we're heavily biased by this contextual information. And, and I was careful to say what is on the face, okay? But you still read the other stuff as well. Uh, so you have to um, recognize that when people read faces, per se, they're not just reading the faces. So when computers read faces, if we want the answers to be like people, we have to do more than read faces. So it's, a, it's a, actually an extraordinarily difficult problem. Let's look a little bit more at this problem. And this, uh, this slide introduces my colleague, Dr. Rana el Kalyubi, who began this work at the University of Cambridge and has been continuing it uh, in our lab at MIT, my collaborator on this. And actually, she's the one who architected and developed the software that I'll be showing you for reading faces. She um, has the worst commute of anybody in my group. She comes in regularly from Cairo. So we, we are very familiar with Skype and Gtalk, and if you have any better things to recommend, we'll try them uh, for constantly interacting at a distance and trying to know when's a good time to interrupt the other person. You know, if you could reveal your, instead of manually setting your status to busy or available, right, if it could just see that I'm really concentrating on something and don't bug me now versus I'm flitting around, you know, um, and now's a good time to interrupt, that would be much more valuable, right, than being interrupted at the wrong time. Um, now, I'm jumping to autism here, but it's actually a natural jump. Here's the, here, here's the way I got introduced to autism. Uh, a lot of people on the autism spectrum, and not everybody, but a, a large number, have difficulties reading facial expressions. Let me refine that a little bit. Some of them are great at reading facial expressions on the computer or watching you from across the room and maybe even better than some of us at detecting and being sensitive to things like stress. But in a real-time face-to-face interaction, especially when they're trying to process language at the same time, faces can be overwhelming and extremely difficult to process. Uh, and autism now, uh, actually, these numbers are a couple years old, when it was 1 in 150, and I heard some leaks of early numbers, I haven't seen them formally released yet, that it's looking more like 1 in 100 with the latest numbers coming up. This, is, this extraordinary growth curve is, uh, is still continuing um, with its phenomenal rise for at least, it looks like, the last couple years. This growth is largely due in part to loosening up of the diagnostic criteria and greater awareness of this uh, diagnostic category, and this does include people with Asperger's, and of which many more are getting diagnosed later in life. I already heard some jokes here about the computer science department, and a lot of faculty perhaps having Asperger's. We, a lot of my friends and, and colleagues at MIT, as you can imagine, you know, are in the same situation. Uh, we, we feel very comfortable around people uh, on the autism spectrum, shall we say, um, very uh, accepting and kindred spirits in many ways. So this, um, one of the problems that often accompanies autism is a difficulty in reading faces. So Rana el Kalyubi and I came together uh, to try to see if we could build technology that would help people to process facial information in real time. Yes, it's important for emotional intelligence and computers, but right away it's critically needed by people who have difficulty with this. And that's pretty cool, right? If something we could develop um, right now could be useful in improving somebody's life uh, and helping them to deal with something that's a real challenge for them. So we have uh, taken uh, data that was gathered by Simon Baron Cohen at the Autism Research Center, University of Cambridge. And he, these um, six words in green are the ones I'll show you a, a system trying to recognize live in a few moments here. And these are kind of umbrella words. They're not perfect descriptions for what you'll see the system recognizing. They're categories that refer actually to a much larger set of uh, expressions, 
that were made by British actors, in this case, uh, and these are the words in white, and there are actually many more than are shown on this slide. So for example, when uh, people acted assertive or committed or persuaded or sure, all of those get lumped under agreeing, right? Even though agreeing might mean something a little different uh, to us. So we have to be a little um, loose on some of these categories here. The way this works is it uses uh, dynamic Bayes nets to, and, and hidden Markov models, sub, subset of this graphical models, to uh, interpret, to, to take in ordinary data from a webcam, you know, regular videos here, regular video frame rate stuff, it'll actually work down to about 15 frames per second. Uh, track points on the face, I'll just show you this live in a moment, um, pull out features. Those of you who are really interested in the computer vision can um, see our papers or we can talk more about it in the break afterwards. And uh, tries to recognize individual action units that are kind of maybe analogous to the phonemes in words. And then also um, bigger movements that might mean something like a, like a smile, uh, more sort of like word spotting. And then also changes in patterns of those over time that are maybe more like reading phrases and sentences. So uh, this is trying to recognize a lot of messages on your face happening over different time scales and interpreting them as uh, an internal state through inference of that state based upon patterns it's seen on the outside. So now let's try to do a live demo here. Actually, it's more fun to get somebody from the audience to do this because you won't, it's not as exciting, right, if you see it on me. Can I have a volunteer? Somebody who'd like to come down and make faces in front of my computer? Yes, hi, come on down. Okay. Oh, good. And say your name? Valerie. Valerie, thank you. Are you a student or faculty? Or? Student, excellent. Okay. So there's a webcam built into my computer, and now it's got, it's found Valerie's face. I'm going to turn off the sound for a second. We added, um, speaking of the states for National Federation of Blind was interested in this. A lot of blind people have said the thing they most wish they could see is not, you know, how beautiful Marilyn Monroe was or the grandeur of the Grand Canyon or whatever, but the face of the person they're talking with, right? Could, they just wish they could see that. Um, how they're responding to them. Are they interested or bored, yawning? <laughs> um, so you can see we've um, it's put orange points on Valerie's face. That's actually a, a piece of software that we did not develop. The tracker was developed. This is the one developed by Hartman Nevin, uh, used, um, that became Nevin Vision, bought by Google. Um, we have written trackers over the years, but uh, this one is better than the ones we had written. Um, Valerie, you're great. <laughs> So it's tracking you nicely. It knows if you're there or not, right? If we, we turn it away whoops, or from either of us, it stops. Okay, it knows there's not a person there. That's kind of important, right? Technology that acknowledges the presence of a human being already makes you feel a little better when it sees you're there. And how many of you have been like to a, a service counter or the doctor's office, I know, and I drop off my kids. Um, if the person there doesn't even look up and acknowledge that we're there, I always feel a little bit like, come on, at least look at us, we're here, you know? <laughs> Make a little eye contact or something. Uh, and this is a way technology could at least acknowledge your presence, right? Um, the tracker then is feeding the, those point locations to different stages in Rana's algorithm that try to recognize individual action units, um, movements of inner and outer brow, lip curve, whole bunch of muscle movements on the face, and then a higher level of those, which is things like nodding or shaking your head, uh, and then those are... Um, Oh, good. See, nice head nod there. See, when this bar gets long and green, it's getting your head shake. Uh, got a little lip pull, a little bit of a smile there. Um, now, this is not trained on you right now, but see how this purple line is high right here when you were doing all that nodding? This is the probability, probability is close to one there when you're nodding, that the purple state, which is agreeing, is high. So when she's nodding or smiling, um, agreeing looks high. Now, when I just said that, I'm getting disagreeing is high here, this red one went up, you're frowning at me, because um, maybe you weren't feeling agreeing, you were just looking agreeing, um, and now she's agreeing again, purple's high, good job, you know, and now interest went up when this whole ordeal happened, um, and green is high here, uh, interested, and that's based more on brow raise and all. Now, this doesn't mean that Valerie feels interested agreeing or disagreeing, what it means is that her outward appearance, um, the movements of that are similar to the movements that we, that we obtained from the British Actor Database um, that were associated with these labels, of what people perceived them as looking like they were feeling, right? So you can still fool this. It's not reading your innermost feelings. Uh, it's reading how you signal these things in the typical way, um, which also can be culturally dependent and so forth. And now it looks like you're concentrating at it and thinking. And, but I saw a little confusion there, too. 
Uh, you looked confused. It doesn't mean you are confused. Are you confused? I'm, I'm working on looking confused. You're working on looking confused. Now, another thing is not everybody does that in the same way. And this is across a group of British actors. And are you a British actor? No. Yeah. American, <laughs> American actor. <laughs> you are an American actor. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that explains that great expressivity. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Valerie. It's great. There are also some different interfaces there that uh, were just to simplify data. I could tell you more about or interested in for autism. Um, accuracy is always an interesting question with these kinds of computer vision programs. And one of the things uh, to, to do, you know, like what's the truth? Like what are people really feeling? You know, and that, that maybe is not actually even the right question with this. It's maybe how close is the computer at doing this to what people do? So the comparison. Rana did here was to have 18 people look at videos. Uh, and, and here, actually, um, the hardest test is not to train and test on different subsets of actors, but to train on, say, the subset of actors and to test on a completely different group of people recorded under completely different conditions with different cameras, different lighting. And here, people at conferences with people walking behind them and all kinds of noisy garbage that usually breaks the computer vision. So that's what was done here. So we don't have anywhere close to the 80 to 90% you see in the publications when you train and test on different subsets of actors. Uh, what we have here is the six categories I showed you. Uh, the quote unquote truth in the frontier is what people were intending to express. This axis is the same six categories of what 18 people said they saw. Okay, So the perfect score would be 100% across the diagonal cylinders here. And we see far from that here. The highest one is this red cylinder, 77% accuracy, when the person intended to appear disagreeing and the 18 panelists thought they looked like they were disagreeing. It's interesting. The highest ones are disagreeing and agreeing, positive and negative. If you think about if you build um, machine learning systems or you teach children, you're interested in them learning, uh, one of the most important things to get across is, is is it going well? Is it not going well? Is it right? Is it wrong? You need that one bit of feedback, right? Did the system get it right or not? Good, good move, bad move. And we see that showing up here in the communication of the facial expressions. The most accurate is that first bit, that positive negative bit. And then the other ones are interesting to look at the confusions. And you can scrutinize these in more detail later. Um, take home message here is this particular piece of software we just ran. Uh, well, first of all, people on average only got 54.5% on these six categories. They're a lot better than random, but they're not that great. We thought people were a lot better at this. The computer was slightly better than the panelists, 63.5%. This does not mean the computer is better than people in general at this task. Okay, This was a restricted task, six categories. Uh, and you have to look at the confusions, which are similar in most cases, uh, which is important, too. We've been um, fascinated learning about the way um, autistic people see the world. And many of them um, describe very different perceptual experiences than the rest of us. And I've worked a lot on computer perception over the years. So I find this absolutely fascinating that some individuals perceive motion differently than we do. They may perceive uh, sound differently. They may perceive a lot more visual detail. They may um, have extraordinary perception in one modality, like auditory, at the same time losing a lot of perceptual abilities in the other domain. Um, some challenges sometimes switching and multiplexing multiple modalities. Uh, Tito Mukhopadhyay, who's very um, auditory oriented and a published poet and all a, a autistic man, um, wrote this, which I just love. He said, faces are like waves, different every moment. Could you remember a particular wave you saw in the ocean? Um, for him, the, the visual complexity of the face is just like when I look at an ocean wave and I, you know it's just got way too many components for me to really make much sense out of. And in fact, the face itself does have, uh, oh, actually, some now are numbering more than the original 43 action units. Each of these little movements, the lip stretch, the lip tightener, the lip presser, the jaw drop, every individual muscle movement and the head movements. And when you combine these together, there are over um, 10,000 different movements. And if we compare that to something like chess, where you've got 20 movements the first time you move a piece, and your opponent has 20, so that makes 400. Um, we see that, that faces are much more complex than, than games like chess when two people are having a face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, this next slide I had made to try to bore people in a talk where we were measuring faces. So I don't expect you to look at all these numbers. And different people have computed the complexity of chess. 
and they've come up with different estimates, which are typically on this order of 10 to the 120. If, if computers were to compute all the possible games in, in chess um, at a billion calculations a second, the computer would need about three times 10 to the 103 years just to consider the space of all the different moves. Um, and yet computers are beating people at chess now, right? The grandmasters, so they're pretty good at this. Um, but think about if the computer had to compute all the facial moves. Uh, when I do something on my face and you do something on your face, and what does that mean for how our interaction is going? And what about in the next move? Well, on the face, with those action units, the combinations you can produce, you get about 10,000 different moves. And instead of having minutes to move, like in chess, you have milliseconds before the next move happens. And it's not just about reading faces, as you saw before with the dirty underwear slide, right? It's also about your fist, your gestures, your posture, your prosody. We've measured uh, over 100 features from prosody that, um, you know, many of which look very promising for telling some affective information from speech. So the space of possibilities uh, in human social interaction completely dwarfs any of the game complexity uh, studies that I've seen in computer science. Right now, chess isn't the most complex. I, I don't know if any, I hear a lot about Go, but this dwarfs Go. I don't know if there's any other game that comes anywhere close to the complexity of human social interaction. Uh, another uh, autistic person, um, Temple Grandin, very famous author and, and professor uh, who's on the autism spectrum, said she could understand simple, strong, universal emotions, but was stumped by more complex emotions in the games people play. Much of the time she said, I feel like an anthropologist on Mars. She has instead to compute others' intentions and states of mind to try to make algorithmic explicit what for the rest of us is second nature. So most of us just see that you know, we've annoyed our spouse or our boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. You just kind of read it quickly. But many people have to recognize all the individual movements and, and try to um, you know, reason about what on earth is happening on that face, perceiving sometimes extraordinary detail and trying to figure this out. Truly overwhelming problem. Uh, if you have to do it this way. I think this may be one of the hardest uh, computer science technology um, engineering challenges that there is to solve today. Uh, I know some people think emotion and affect is like a soft, squishy thing, right? You know, and maybe um, in many of the ways it's been treated in psychology, it is. But when you try to get systematic about getting technology to solve these problems, it is far from that. It is an exceedingly complex problem, um, pretty much any way you dice it. So I'd actually love to challenge more people here to uh, you know, take a deeper, more close, precise look at the challenges in this, because this is um, computationally decoding this is an extraordinary challenge. All right, uh, I want to say a little bit more here about these topics and emotion and emotion regulation, and then we'll try to take some questions here. I've got my one slide on handling emotion here. Uh, this could also be an hour talk, but I'm going to give you the, the one slide version. And we've built technology that does this, but I'm not going to have time to go into that today. Uh, here's, here's the secret to handling emotion, if there is one. And it's illustrated in this cartoon made by my student, Jonathan Klein. Uh, how many of you have dogs? Uh, a lot of people here in the Midwest have dogs. Talk in a place like Japan and they have some ibos, you know, <laughs> very few pets. Okay, so you guys know, like, most people who have dogs tell me their dog is always happy to see them when they come home. You know, tails wagging, dogs jumping up, happy to see you. Um, Master doesn't look very happy today. Uh, don't know why, but he sits down and dog is somehow observing that Master's unhappy. And how do we know that? Because dog puts his ears back and his tail down and kind of looks uh, as if, like a kind of an affective mirror here. Um, Master feels understood. My dog understands me. He's happier now. Dog's happy again. Wag, wag, thump, thump. Um, now, does the people have told me, you know, you can't build technology that handles emotions until we understand what emotion is. And I'm like, well, that's funny. Dogs do a really good job of handling emotion. And I don't, I mean, they have, have they worked out the theory of emotion? I don't know. They haven't published it. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that actually there are a lot of working examples out there of brilliant handling of emotion without having worked out all the problems we're still trying to work out. Now, it's not to say that those problems aren't important to work out. I think they are. We still need to get a lot more understanding. Uh, but, but don't be discouraged if you get stuck on what the definition of emotion is, which I'm conveniently left out of this talk. Uh, so this empathizing, this mirroring, this seeing what there is and responding to it is really important. Um, in autism, this is often broken. 
in um, not just in the difficulty of seeing it in somebody else, but surprisingly also, um, autistic people may feel a certain way on the inside and not show that on the outside uh, in a way that's clearly readable. So one of the stories that really drives a lot of our work right now that's um, maybe one of the ones that um, is most upsetting when I read it in the news is where you hear of a person who uh, was in school and doing well and, and then the following kinds of things happen and they were taken out of school and maybe um, had to be removed from these ideal learning environments. And this is the kind of story where you hear somebody just has these meltdowns and people say they come out of the blue. Okay, and meltdown um, could uh, have as part of it self-injurious behaviors, maybe behaviors to others. Uh, when this is a two-year-old and it's a tantrum and you can put your arms around him and calm him down, you know, it, it's bad, but it's not that bad. When it's somebody our size, then it's scary, right? And that individual uh, is restrained sometimes with um, terrible harm. Um, now, some autistic people seek deep pressure, for, which is calming and soothing, and some have said, you know, that, that is good in small measure, um, but none of the ones that we've communicated with have said that they um, like being forcefully restrained and certainly not removed from learning opportunities and other things. Um, we've had the privilege of getting to know some of the people who've had these, uh, who are covered with scars from self-injurious behaviors and have had, ha had not been able to speak in the past but learned to communicate with uh, various kinds of assistance or maybe by learning another language. And they've told us that these meltdowns uh, never um, came out of the blue. They were always preceded by increased frustration and stress. And they couldn't understand why people around them didn't see it, right? I'm upset. They don't see it. Why are they keeping doing this thing? Kind of like me and Clippy. <laughs> I'm upset at you, Clippy. Why do you keep doing this to me, you know, acting happy? Um, and yet the teacher who sees the child in the classroom says, you know, he looks perfectly calm. Hey, he just looks uncooperative. Come on, Johnny, I know you can do this. Pushes him a little harder because he can do this, and why isn't he doing it today? And he looks calm. Um, so there's this problem in that what's on the outside doesn't match what's on the inside. And so when you respond to what's on the outside, you respond in the wrong way. And that can be really unfortunate. So some of our technology, actually, is we think, um, and we're doing studies with this in classrooms and homes right now, is able to communicate some of what's going on on the inside. And um, the key is to wrap this in a way where people can trust whom they share it with and retain control over it and show on the outside what's going on on the inside. One of the key signals that changes in all of us when we get frustrated or aggravated or stressed, although it also goes up with positive excitement, uh, is the um, sympathetic nervous system activation which innervates pretty much purely the skin. So the skin conductance response is a very good measure of this. All your organs are innervated by sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system except the skin which seems to be predominantly innervated by just the sympathetic. So we get a pretty pure read of this fight or flight sympathetic response from the skin. And then the challenge has been, how do you measure this in daily activity, right? Here they have these nice new compact boxes. It's usually measured with electrodes on the fingers. This is a person playing a game. Um, this is a signal you want to be high when the game is exciting. The game's exciting if you're interested. Your skin conductance response, this is the signal also um, formerly known as galvanic skin response, uh, gets high. And that usually correlates with uh, attention and memory as well as excitement. Years ago, we put this on a glove with an LED and made it adaptable to each person so that when you were very calm, you could dial it dim and then look at how your light glowed um, around your own personal baseline. And in fact, we did this in a large audience of uh, 1,500 people. And it was fun being on stage because you could see the audience glowing every time something exciting happened. Like every time there was a really exciting new speaker coming out, the anticipation, they would glow. Um, and every time there was a live demo, like we've just made this thing work. It's the first time anybody in the world has seen it and we're gonna try to reproduce it here on stage right now and everybody's holding their breath and holding your breath makes it glow, um, makes skin conductance go up. Uh, and every time there was laughter, um, there was um, skin conductance response. Um, however, uh, all day, every single time there was a PowerPoint presentation, there was a decaying exponential <laughs> in the brightness. And we thought we had the best speakers, but just, so that was uh, this version, uh, and now we have wrist-worn versions. Let's see if I'm on live here, recording my talk. Yep, so here's, uh, here's my level right now. Actually, I'm fairly low this afternoon for me, giving a talk. But you can see my signal streaming along here live. If somebody comes up and startles me or asks an embarrassing question or something, you'll, you'll see it go up. Definitely mellow. Hmm. 
interesting. Um, hope I'm keeping you awake. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Oh, here, thinking about that. Wait, I just felt my skin conductance response go up. Yep, see? <laughs> You don't have to actually, the first time my students put it on me, even before they asked any questions, the thought of what they were going to ask me made it go up more, the anticipatory response. Nothing they asked was as bad as what I could think of that they could ask, right? Um, okay, actually, I, I'm quite accurate now of knowing how my skin conductance changes because I've worn these things for so long that I don't actually need it anymore to look at. That's why I could tell you without having looked at it yet that it had just gone up. Uh, so we, uh, this, is a useful signal for regulating emotion, self-regulation, for understanding oneself, um, for hopefully working well with others with this information. And uh, here's, here's a blogger I'll highly recommend to you. Her name is Amanda Baggs. She's an autism self-advocacy uh, activist, as well as maker of some great videos. This one YouTube one, last I looked, it's probably about 800,000 by now, uh, called In My Language, is, is highly, highly recommended. Uh, so we, we had gone up to visit her with bags of technology, I and um, Rana and a grad student, each of us carrying in two bags of all kinds of things from heads-up displays to physiological sensors and face reading stuff, you know, to just kind of get her take on what we were doing because she liked technology. So this is her blogging about us later that night after we left. Sorry, I'm late with a blog carnival. My home was invaded by interesting geeks. And um, she blogged about these skin conductance sensors that we had taken. Ah, they didn't fit her, blah, blah, blah. Um, but one thing that was really, there were actually a lot of interesting things. Let me just highlight one of the ones she highlighted here. Uh, her level was very high, as was mine at the time. And she had not exhibited these classic autistic behaviors that we knew she'd done from her videos um, while we were there. Um, and so at one point, I said to her, you know, would you like to try rocking? Okay, this is classic rocking behavior like this. And a lot of autistic people flap or flick their hands or these other repetitive behaviors. Uh, so her level was really high, and so she started rocking, and in, the electrodermal activity went down like a slide on a playground when she rocked. It was just amazing. I've never seen such a credible, um, you know, response uh, physiologically for such a simple movement. She pointed out something I didn't notice until I read her blog later. The moment one of them turned her head to look at me, it suddenly jumped up again, and this is before the point of eye contact even, and certainly before I could feel more than a small difference in my stress levels. So this was uh, something interesting. She was, she was starting to use this to notice what things in her environment caused her levels to go up, uh, to reflect on it, to get some of that awareness of cause and effect for, for her individual situation. Um, and then uh, you can read the rest of this online if you want. Basically, she said she'd wish she'd had this on during these interviews CNN had done with her, uh, with Sanjay Gupta, um, because he was trying to lean into her and I, she thought in an attempt at friendliness, the camera, I think, is trying to get a close angle. She has to type to talk. And as he's um, leaning into her and she's typing to talk, as he leans into her, she moves further and further from him until she makes a mistake typing. She's like a fabulous typist, 120 words a minute, very accurate, almost never a spelling error. She makes a spelling error so her speaking device misspeaks. So then she whacks herself, right, because she's upset about making the speaking error. And they're like, oh, look, self-injurious behavior, you know, from autistic person. And this, this was really frustrating to her, right? And she thought if she could have shown him what, you know, what he was doing to her, maybe he would have modulated his behavior. So she said she wondered if showing readings like that to the sort of professionals who are heavily invested in forcing eye contact and other invasive direct forms of interaction on autistic children would make them think twice about it. A lot of people read her blog and have noticed that these physiological components also can change with um, diabetes and blood glucose levels, awake, asleep. If you're interested in this, let me know. We're, we've been gathering lots of data now that it's so easy to get around the clock, and we have all kinds of interesting data related to other medical conditions now with electrodermal activity. Uh, and in fact, this has made us rethink how we're doing science in this area, too. You know, traditionally, if you want to understand something like physiology and emotion, you bring people into the lab, you know, you show them a movie or something to try to make them feel a certain emotion, you measure their physiology, you gather the data, you digitize it, you run your favorite machine learning or other algorithms on it to try to uh, pull out the most predictive variables of affective state, and you hopefully get good results there, you average those together, you know, and publish it with some hopefully highly statistically significant finding, and maybe, maybe, maybe somebody who was in your study later finds out there was a paper on this and wonders if their results matched what was in that paper, right? But rarely do individuals learn about themselves when they come in for these scientific studies. 
So we, we think now we have the opportunity to, um, oh, and furthermore, the data we've gotten from individuals in these studies is usually like a 30 to 45 minute snapshot, right? It's kind of like taking a few notes from the middle of Beethoven's Ninth and averaging it and saying you've described the symphony. You know, when, when you're measuring people's physiology, uh, we've been learning it changes dramatically over the course of the day. And my baselines, my so-called baseline, you know, during um, an afternoon uh, presentation versus, you know, um, a morning, uh, you know, reading session versus uh, exercise or all kinds of things. These baselines can vary dramatically, and even while asleep, in between sleep stages. So we, uh, we think it's really important to kind of rethink the way these data are gathered and interpreted and enable more people to learn about themselves by giving them the instruments, giving them the laboratory, um, take it home, learn about yourself, and then if you choose, since it's always your choice freely whether or not to participate in a scientific study, um, make it easy for you to upload your data anonymously if you wish, share it, see how your patterns cluster with other people, are you like another group of people, how are you different from another group of people, what um, genes do you share, what features, what attributes, what interests, could be a new dating game, I don't know, <laughs> find the person maximally different. Uh, and um, we think this could be really interesting to think about how some of these um, new affective and wearable technologies can be, uh, lead to actually a different kind of science as well. Nearing the end here, this is um, one last topic I want to touch on and then we'll wrap up, is just a couple of um, social and philosophical concerns. And uh, I'll just touch on a couple of these. One, one is it's very, very important in our work that, that people not have information read from them that they don't want read from them uh, and possibly even used to abuse them. This is a very, unfortunately, common problem among people who are in institutions or hospitals or who have various disabilities. There's an extraordinary amount of abuse. And so by no means do we want to enable more of that, right? So in working with these individuals, we found they want control. You know, if I don't want to be measured, you know, I want to take it off. Right? I don't want something that's going to sit in the corner up there and measure me whether I want to be measured or not. I want to have control over it. Okay? So if I trust you, I can put it on. I can control. We have different ways you could touch different ones and share your information with people you trust and not share it with people you don't. Ways you can fool it, fake it out. Those are part of what we want to provide, too, if people want that. So it's very important to us to um, give people control over what they're doing so that um, others are less likely to be trying to control them. Um, People sometimes say things you wear are more invasive. Uh, actually, sometimes things that look at you and reveal your identity are even more invasive than something that's in contact with you. So we want to offer people things to choose from that honor their comfort. Um, if you're comfortable with a camera pointed at you, you can use the face reading thing. If you're not, turn that off, right? Um, we don't want to force anything on, on anybody here. It's important that you be in charge of what's um, communicated. Oh, golly, there's so much stuff on deception. Let's skip that one. <laughs> um, you want to know about deception? You can ask in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, people have, um, the um, cave paintings of Lascaux a long time ago, people said, gee, Roz, you know, you're giving machines emotional abilities, artificial stuff. I mean, that's stuff that machines didn't used to have. Only people had that. Um, do you think that maybe when you give it to technology, it's going to cheapen our belief of how special it makes people, right? If emotion makes us special and suddenly you're giving this to technology, um, you know, like when they took these magnificent cave paintings and they duplicated them so that the tourists wouldn't wreck the originals, the tourists would all go see the duplicates and preserve the originals, then somehow the original, the whole thing didn't seem as special anymore, right? Because it could be duplicated. And as we um, take this special stuff about us and put it in technology and allow it to represent it and manipulate it and sometimes appear to even have emotion, are we somehow messing up that part of us that uh, is special because of our emotional abilities? Um, so I'll throw that out as an interesting topic to discuss. And then uh, there's a lot of people out there who want to just like cheer you up. Um, I won't name the companies. Uh, but certainly, you know, if, you know, people, a lot of people think that if you're upset, you should be cheered up. You know, if you're an upset driver, you're a less safe driver, so we should pipe happy music at you. Bad idea, right? Don't pipe the happy music. Deal, deal, do, do something a little more subdued first. Um, but actually, there's an important reason to have bad emotional states, right? And these are, uh, these are states that motivate this wind out of the sails um, phenomenon. Was it, um, gosh, it was many years ago when, 
Lee Iacocca was giving the commencement ceremony at MIT. I know I mentioned earlier that's one of the happiest days at MIT. Everybody's walking around just positively beaming. And this day, the sun was shining, the flowers were blooming, the grass was green. You know, they've been manicuring the campus for weeks because the alumni are coming back, and maybe they'll give more money if the campus looks nicer. Um, the students are happy they're graduating. The parents are happy because they don't have to pay bills anymore to MIT. Uh, everybody's happy. And Lee Iacocca gets up there, and he, um, he's speaking to the graduates. And he charges them. I'm afraid if I do what he did, my laptop's going to jump off the table. And he's like, you must get angry. You must get angry. You guys got to get angry. You know, don't, you know, don't be so happy. Get angry. OK. <laughs> They're all kind of like, who hired this guy to wreck our day? You know? um, and his message was, if, if you're just happy all the time, you're not going to make a difference in the world. Right? You, know, you got to have you know, a little motivation. And sometimes the bad states um, make you want to ch fix the world and make it better. Right? So things that upset you, um, those, you know, the Prozac to cheer you up may not be such a good idea. Right? Go ahead and um, take that anger and channel it to uh, build a better operating system, or build a better product, or build a better thesis, or um, you know, improve the environment um, where you are. All right, so thank you all. I've been through a bunch of things here. Uh, sort of under this template, technology, it's easy to make it look like it has emotions, but when to express what emotion is important. I think that heavily depends upon its ability to recognize states from you. Uh, if you portray them accurately, others around you can use um, empathy and techniques kind of like the dog use to help you feel better, to help you manage your emotions. But if you don't, you might need help um, communicating them accurately. Some of the affective technology we think can help with that. It can also help you learn about your own feelings, things in your environment that cause you to um, increase stress or increase your productivity, being in certain states that are conducive to that. Not all stressful or negative states are bad. Some of them can be very powerful and effective and motivating and good. Uh, and you can then utilize those, hopefully, in, in service of uh, greater good. So I'll, with that, I'll just um, end and thank you and ask that you um, challenge you, hopefully, to think about including uh, emotion in the work that you do. Uh, I've talked a lot about it. I've kind of over-tilted the balance, kind of all about affect. Uh, I do that because I think affect has been missing so much from what people do. Uh, but certainly, to just build computers that are emotional would be a bad idea. You know, what we really need is a balance in computing and uh, challenge you to help uh, restore that balance between the affective and the cognitive uh, in the technology and the systems and the work that you do here. So thank you very much. We'll briefly take questions. We have mics on the two sides, so you can be recorded as part of the recording. Uh, please come forward. Anything about wearable, wearable sensor systems for movement rather than for skin conductance? Mm. Um, actually, we have a motion detector in this, mm -hmm. and uh, so I could get um, three-axis accelerometer out of it. But a lot of people have built their low-cost um, motion detectors that are wireless now. Uh, Joe Paradiso in our lab, in the Media Lab, has built a bunch of them. Use them in raves and dances and stuff like that. So I would start by contacting him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the that I mean, and I've seen this too. That autistic people not only can't see emotions, but they also don't express them. It, how much? I mean, is that because? Why do you think that is? Is that because mm, they don't? Yeah. They don't so, learn by seeing other people's emotions. Yeah, some some do. Um, for many people, there is um, there are motor difficulties that accompany the autism, and what we'll see sometimes is their motor system will kind of shut in and out. You know, sometimes they'll express emotion, and it looks like what you would expect to see. Sometimes they'll express it and it comes out wrong, like laughing, uh, sad things. Um, at other times, the same person who can express it appropriately, it's sometimes their, their face just loses its tone, and sometimes they lose their ability to move. So in fact, you might ask them to do something, they suddenly can't move, and you, you don't realize this is an ability that comes and goes. And you know that it's almost as if that the, if they're in such a state of, one hypothesis is that they're in a state of overload and they're unable, the, the motor system is, is uh, not functioning because of that state of overload. But we, to be honest, really don't have a clear understanding of why the motor system is, uh, is you know, so unpredictable in, in these individuals. Hello. 
By the way, that's part of what can make it so hard to speak, too, right? Because producing words is really complicated, getting all the motor uh, movements coordinated. Most of us do it without thinking, but a lot of people on the autism spectrum describe they have to think about moving every one of those muscles to get it to happen. So uh, there seems to be something special about the number six. Can you speculate as to why there are only six basic facial expressions? Oh, well, no, I don't think it's special about six. That's, Paul Ekman has been promoting six. Sometimes he's promoted seven. Um, I, I don't think it's such a special number. So, but they always describe them as six. And there have been some studies for uh, blind and deaf children, and they only uh -huh. can express these six. And then they kind of diversify based on the cultural influences. Yeah, I think people have found what they were looking for there. Because there are others, like contempt, that turn out to be pretty important in some other situations. Also, it depends what situations you look at. These are largely posed um, static photo cases where those six have been uh, emphasized. And you know, if you go, for example, in learning environments where you measure kids, say, using tutors and computers, we've done a bunch of work there, collaboration with Memphis, and um, we don't see those basic six. We see boredom, boredom, <laughs> boredom, <laughs> interest, <laughs> frustration, <laughs> anger, boredom, interest. You know, we, we see very different things there. Thank you. Delight, occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, you're using the whole face, although we know that persons with the autism spectrum disorders tend to uh, mm -hmm. fixate their gaze too much on the mouth. On the mouth, And right. the mouth does not really communicate much of anything. And a lot of the images that you showed had a lot of extra data there. We were seeing hands, and we were seeing gestures, and we were seeing a lot of things. And so how do you focus your research that, so that you're really teaching those, um, those persons that the, the affect is coming yeah. through our eyes? Yeah, I, I don't have slides of this here right now, but my student, Micah Eckhart, has been developing a system to focus on the eyes and using big, very vivid eyes, actually, that kind of make, they actually make my skin conductance go up looking at them, I could tell even without wearing this. Uh, and they, um, he's taking the eyes test from Simon Baron Cohen, you know, just those slices of eye images, yep. and giving kids tangible puzzles to put this with um, active RFID that allows them to get real feedback in a tangible physical space with these giant photos of eyes. So we haven't, um, we've just got the system working. We've just done some um, pilot stuff with kids. So I can't claim if it's going to be effective yet. Uh, but that's one way to go into this. There's also some commercial software out there that is um, letting kids look at faces. And it's doing things like masking them with animals and stuff and drawing attention to the eyes. And I think that's a very clever approach also. Do you think there will be a difference between these Asperger children that you're focusing on versus the Canners children, which are much more profoundly uh, disabled? Um, do I think there'll be a difference between the Asperger children and, and, and the which? canners? And, oh. and ones who maybe don't have language and who are... Yes, the much more profoundly affected. Yeah, more profoundly affected. Um, so I've worked with some of the very profoundly affected people who are great at reading these facial expressions, but they don't want to look at faces in real interaction. Don't make me look at a face. They can do it on the computer, great, but real world, I don't want to do eye contact. You know, and once they really get to know you, then they'll bore into your eyes and it feels really intimate, actually. Uh, but face to face, just you know, not interested. Um, the ones who have been asking most for this are the Aspergers, the, the kids who are out having social interactions and can't understand, especially guys and adolescents, why that girl walked off. You know, I wish I had the deja vu system. I could play back. You know, what did I do wrong? You know, what was you know, I missed all the cues. All of a sudden, I thought we were doing well, and I was telling her all about my goldfish collection, and and then she just walked off. You know. One more question, yeah, Tom. Uh, this is, well, um, I just saw something I thought interesting in the data between the humans and the computers recognizing the six basic emotions. The humans, there seemed to be a correlation between um, interest, cor um, concentration, and thinking. Uh -huh. And I got thinking about it and thought, what is the difference between concentration and uh -huh. thinking? And, and, but there seemed to be less of a correlation looking at the data for the computer, even though the computer was more accurate. Um, just it was an, an interesting contrast a little bit, and I wonder if you could explore that. When people make mistakes, do they make? The same ones. Are they, are they more likely to make the same ones, and is the computer not? And then mm -hmm. is that a clue to what the computer needs to do? 
Yeah, some, so for example, people and the computer both seem to confuse the concentrating and the, and the thinking. Uh, and um, here those are, again, these words are kind of problematic, right? Because we concentrate and think at the same time, you know, what's the difference? Here they were, uh, they're a bit more tailored than that. When I'm focused on you and I'm attending to you or I'm attending to the computer, it calls that concentrating, outward. When I tend to tilt my head and kind of roll my eyes up and go internally, then that's, it calls that thinking. Now, mind you, you're thinking in both cases, right? But it's more of a signal of, I'm, I need to process for a moment, leave me alone, versus I'm attending to you, keep the data coming at me. And so that's the distinction aimed for there. Um, interest is um, easily confused with those two, and is um, here operationalized more as eyebrows up, you know, maybe the mouth down a little bit, a little bit closer to surprise, moving forward, you know, more, um, dr uh, you know, approach um, engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's wrap it up. Uh, Ross Picard will be available outside uh, in the atrium until 2.30. Thank you. <laughs>